Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name's Dylan Edwards. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. And it's a huge pleasure for me to welcome and introduce Nick Steele to give his inaugural lecture, Doctors and Patients, Why Big Data Must Leave Space for Small Talk. So uh, I've got a bit of a background here on, on Nick, and I'll, I'll, um, it, it's clear I didn't write it, but I'll, uh, so you'll see in, in a little while. So at, at school, Nick enjoyed pottery, woodwork, and biology in that order which led his inspired teacher to recommend medicine as his obvious career choice. <laughs> Unconvinced about this, Nick worked as an auxiliary nurse on a male orthopaedic ward before moving outdoors to pig farming and uh, agricultural labour. He did, however, get into medical, medical school and qualified just in 1988 after taking an extra year to study English literature halfway through. So after training as a general practitioner in Sheffield, Nick's work as combined obstetrician and paediatrician in an Australian rural hospital sparked a lifelong interest in health outcomes and the, their potential, and the potential harms of medical interventions. He was, in his own words, too incompetent to attempt a caesarean section or keep a very low birth weight baby alive and functionally intact. So did nothing unless there was absolutely no alternative and was surprised to achieve some of the best health outcomes in the country for mothers and babies. Back in the UK and working as a general practitioner in uh, the contrasting environments of urban deprivation in Westerhales, Edinburgh, and rural North Norfolk. Nick, Nick became interested in the different views of patients, GPs, and hospital clinicians about the balance of benefits and harms from treating raised blood pressure. Nick went on to train in public health and health policy at the University of Cambridge and Rand Health in California as a Harkness Fellow in Health Care Policy before returning to Norfolk to try to earn a living in medical research. Nick's research which we're going to hear about today, his interests focus on preventing adverse events and improving outcomes in people with complex health problems managed in primary care. His current research projects include a study of GPs and people with multiple conditions setting goals together, measuring health in, the older, in older participants in the English longitudinal study of ageing, using global health burden of disease study in England, analysis of primary care databases, THIN and CPRD, and primary health care for vulnerable adults, including the homeless and refugees. Nick Steele was appointed as a professor in, at UEA in January 20, 2016, so it's taken us a while to get through, through the pipeline up to here. So, but please join me the, now in, in, in welcoming Nick to, to, to give his inaugural lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dylan. Great again. Our, our leaves are falling. Come spring, we will renew. But you, alas, fall once. So artificial human character in uh, Ian McEwan's novel. Um, and in, in the real world... I'll move on to the first slide. Uh, in, in the real world, uh, machines can hold more factual knowledge than the human brain. Uh, they are increasingly able to learn, and they are increasingly being used in the NHS, particularly for diagnosis and uh, reading scans. But I'm sure the uh, role of machines uh, in roles that have traditionally been taken, taken place by doctors will increase in the future. So I've got, I've got up here an admittedly truncated and personal view of the history of medicine. And um, what I, the question I'm posing is, will... Uh, Demis Hassabis's name be as well known to doctors of the future as Archie Cochrane or Alexander Fleming who discovered penicillin. Uh, and I thought we should start, I was actually coming back in the car today uh, with Max Yates, some of you may know, he's a rheumatologist here who, who knows all about Julian of Norwich. He said, where are you talking? I said, well, it's in the Julian uh, lecture theatre. So he gave me a tutorial on Julian of Norwich. And I was thinking that traditional role she was, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure you all do, this lecture theatre is named after after her, she was an anchoress, which means she was anchored in a, a medieval church in the 14th century in Norwich. 
and people would bring her arms and leave her money in her will and she would provide wise counsel. If you had a problem, you'd go and talk to her and she became very well known for uh, this counselling role, which is an essential, I think, an essential human characteristic. Uh, and the question I'll be posing this evening is to what extent can computers take over that role of wise counsel? Uh, so I'd just like to, to start by having, having a, a look at the kind of problems we're facing in healthcare at the moment uh, and think about where AI might be able to contribute to them. So we can see uh, this is some work uh, from Barnett and colleagues in Scotland, but it's essentially a similar picture uh, in England about multimorbidity. And we can see we've got along, along the x-axis on the bottom, we've got age group in five-year age bands. And then the percentage of people who have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight or more uh, long-term conditions or disorders. And you can see at the age of 50, roughly 50% 50 of people have a chronic condition. At 60, roughly 60%, 70, roughly 70%, 80, roughly 80%. So this uh, rise in the number of chronic conditions, we are uh, facing a, uh, a future where most people are managing at least one and often as many as eight or nine chronic conditions at the same time. Uh, and uh, prescribed medications follow this a across Europe. One in three people aged over 65 uh, takes at least five medications per day. So along with this multimorbidity, we've got lots and lots of uh, uh, medicines being prescribed, not all taken, as I'm sure you know, but being prescribed. Uh, and we spend a lot of money on that. The NHS uh, drugs bill um, last year was, uh, was £18 billion and is going up at 8% a year, which is more than the current spending plans. Uh, for increase in um, NHS spending for the, for the drugs bill alone. Uh, and of course, medicines cause harm. Uh, between 5 and 10% of hospital admissions are related to harm from medicines. Um, and uh, it's a rare person who enjoys taking medicines or who, who hopes to be diagnosed with another long-term condition. Um, so uh, some of you may know Martin Marshall, who's an academic GP who was, has just taken over as uh, chair of the Royal College of GPs, and he was interviewed in The Guardian last week as kind of first interview as the new chair of the college, and, and he said medicine has overstretched itself, um, uh, and we're kind of sheep dipping the population in statins, was his phrase, which you may have kind of got as it kind of uh, uh, chimed. It was a great soundbite, I thought, sheep dipping the population in statins. Uh, and uh, he's not alone in these concerns about over medicalization. Atul Gawande, an American surgeon, writer, and public health doctor, who uh, anyone who's involved in medical school admissions or uh, helping children get through will, will know about because he seems to be almost compulsory reading. Um, but he describes the problem as overkill, an avalanche of unnecessary medical care that is harming patients physically and financially. So, how have we got here, uh, and what might the role be for AI? Rosa is 69 years old and has been diagnosed with diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and osteoarthritis. She takes separate medicines for each of these conditions. It's December 2020, and Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital has been selected as the pilot site for AI in the NHS, which the government hopes will be the solution to the failure to recruit the promised 5,000 extra GPs and 50,000 extra nurses. Rosa has been concerned about a small mole on her forearm. She could not get an appointment with her GP for six weeks, and so registered with Ziggurat Health, which I thought was a much better name than, than Babylon Health if I was designing it. So registered with Ziggurat Health, a company registered in Jersey with numerous NHS contracts to provide primary care through its GP at large chatbot app. The chatbot asked about Rose's ideas, concerns, and expectations, and expressed sadness that her son had malignant melanoma some years ago. The chatbot had been programmed with six basic emotions, happy, sad, afraid, disgusted, angry, and surprised, but only ever needed sad and had learned not to express disgust. It requested Rosa take a picture of the mole on her forearm on her smartphone, which it analyzed using machine learning algorithms based on the hospital database of annotated melanoma photos and immediately advised an appointment at uh, NNUH Dermatology outpatient appointment the next day. Rosa took a small electric driverless car to the hospital following the quickest route devised by Google Maps algorithms, the car smoothly avoiding a small child on a bike wobbling suddenly off the pavement in front of her, as the car has successfully analysed the child's body language and anticipated the loss of control. Rosa was dropped at the door of the hospital with no parking charge to pay and greeted by a computer terminal wearing a Royal Volunteer Service apron. <laughs> The computer advised Rosa that she was overdue for her retinal scan and escorted her for a scan while she waited to see a dermatologist. 
The dermatologist was concerned about the legal implications of ignoring the ziggurat chatbot's concern and arranged for Rosa's mole to be surgically removed. On her way out of the appointment, Rosa was advised that the deep learning architecture used to analyse her retinal scan had recommended urgent referral to an ophthalmologist with an option for robotic surgery if she did not want to risk the nine-month wait to see a surgeon. This fictional scenario is based on existing technology. The collaboration between DeepMind and Murfield's Eye Hospital has developed a deep learning model for analysing uh, OCT optical coherence tomography scans, retinal scans, in, in 2018. Uh, and it can make referral decisions as good as experts. Um, and um, I've got the, the results slide uh, here, which I'll talk you through. So the, the, the big advance in this paper, there's been, um, AI has been used to look, look at x-rays for quite some time, and the, and the big stumbling block has been getting a machine that can work across different platforms. So if you have your Mitsubishi eye scanner, you can train a machine eventually to, to read scans on that machine, but then you, you stick it in the hospital with a Toshiba scanner and it falls over, it can't do it. And the big breakthrough on this was twofold. One, they, they managed to get the, 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 um, the, the learning architecture to work across platforms. So it was platform independent, they could train it on one machine, it would work on another. Uh, and the other thing they did is, uh, which was a breakthrough in terms of the number of scans that were needed for training, uh, is they could uh, separate out the issues of uh, inter-patient pathology difference. So if you have a problem with retinal detachment or whatever it might be in your eye, uh, the pathology in my eye is going to be slightly different from the pathology in anyone else's eye, and that's been a problem for machines. And then you combine that with the problem of the different platforms, uh, and this has uh, meant that machines up until now have needed a very large number of scans. But the, the breakthrough on this was they could train a machine in about 14,000 scans, they had annotated scans, it, it, it read them all, learnt them, and it, it was then performing better than the, uh, the retina specialists and optometrists on this scan. So the blue line at the far side is the model, our model, uh, and the higher the bar, the more mistakes it's making. And we can see that uh, it's, it, it's performing as well as the retina, uh, uh, as well as all but two of the retina specialists were as good as it, and it's better than the other retina specialists, and better than the optometrists. Uh, the yellow bars are when they added in for the humans, they added in another fundal scan and a review of the clinical notes, and then the humans became almost as good as the computer without. So that's where we are uh, at the moment with, um, with scans, and I think, you know, there's very exciting uh, potential here, but my, my worry is, is this going to drive what Atul Gawande was calling the avalanche of unnecessary medical care by being able to refer people at ever faster rates on to, to more interventions and more treatment and more, uh, more diagnoses. So um, I'll stick with Atul Gawande for a minute. Uh, and and he, he, he says, uh, he's actually not talking about AI, he's talking about the current healthcare situation without AI, but I think it applies to AI as well. He says, our key mistake is failing to recognise that people have goals and priorities for their care besides just living longer. To learn what those are, we have to ask, but mostly we don't. When we don't, the care we provide is often out of alignment with what matters most to people. The result is suffering. When clinicians do ask, however, and align their care with people's goals and priorities, the results can be remarkable according to the evidence. Uh, with less suffering, less non-beneficial treatments, more control and equal or longer survival. And this echoes David Sackett, who uh, was the, uh, one of the main uh, originators of evidence-based medicine, which is very influential for my generation training in the 1990s in medicine. Uh, and evidence-based medicine, I think, has, has been hijacked rather by the, the guideline industry, if you like, about uh, evidence. But originally it was about marrying evidence with the, the patient's priorities, and I think we need to get back to that. And David Sackett's uh, original description of, of EBM, or evidence-based medicine, was the, the conscientious, explicit and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. Uh, which he emphasised needed thoughtful identification and compassionate use of individual patients, predicaments and preferences. So how can we find out about patients' priorities, predicaments and preferences? Uh, it's hard enough to, to, to know our own. So just, just as a little experiment for 10 seconds, I'm going to shut up for 10 seconds, I'd like you to close your eyes. I'm not going to ask you to tell me the, what, you, what you think of, but I want you to think of, of, of uh, your number one goal for your life in the next six months. Okay, I don't know if anyone wants to volunteer whether they've managed to formulate a, a clear, clear goal in, in 10 seconds. 
Um, maybe some of you have, some of you haven't. Certainly, I, I, I find that very difficult. And it's, it's not a simple thing to do, to be clear about what we want, and I think a conversation is needed. So um, we've, uh, we, we recently did a study we called the Gold Plan Study, where we got doctors to talk to patients, particularly patients with a lot of uh, diagnoses and taking a lot of medications. Um, and I'm, I've got a, a clip here where one, one, one of our uh, doctors introduces the study, and he, he explains it better than I can, uh, which I think is the next one up. Yeah. Normally, medicine is all about what the doctor thinks is the right thing in a way, isn't it? And this is uh, to find out what difference it makes if you say, this is what I want to uh, achieve. Um, sometimes medical, sometimes not so medical. Uh, we are, at the end of the study, we asked doctors and patients uh, what they thought, and I've got a, uh, a slide here of some of the things patients said. One of the one I, I like is the, the GP here, 18, who, who, who talks about the joy of it, you know, what the joy, the joy of not having to tick boxes. This is about delivering, for those of you who are GPs, delivering on, on, on quality indicators for, for payment for delivery of particular activities. So the, the GPs in the study, or, or admitted a selected group, loved it. They said it was getting back to what they thought of as proper medicine. And the patients uh, uh, enjoyed it as well. One of the striking things was the, the, the number of patients who, who, and these are patients who are very ill, who are spending a lot of time down the doctor's surgery, and the patients who said it was wonderful being able to see the same doctor more than once, which um, I thought was interesting in itself. Um, so, um, yeah, so the... the the, the theme, one of the themes that emerged in this is the power of the consultation, the fact that the, the act of the doctor and the patient sitting down and having a conversation seemed to have had a, a therapeutic effect and enabled patients to achieve what they wanted to achieve in their lives, sometimes without even realising. We had one of, the, one of the patients we interviewed said, I don't know how it worked, you know, I didn't achieve the goals I set out to achieve, but I'm in a much better place now. So there seemed to be something about that power of the consultation between two human beings sitting down and developing a relationship of trust. Um, Okay, so um, how can trust be maintained w w without that mutual understanding of the patient's problem? So my, I was originally, I worked as a GP, as most of you know, and my desire to um, leave a career in general practice and take up research was my, fa my failure to understand my, my patient's reasons for taking uh, treatment for high blood pressure. I thought they were taking it to, to reduce their risk of a future stroke, but they told me they were taking medicine for their headaches or their tiredness, or simply because the doctor had asked them to and they didn't know why. Uh, so I thought I'd ask them about their tolerance for risk, which is this is the first study I did at UEA, uh, where it was expressed as the number of ne people needed to, to, to take treatment for five years to prevent one of them having an adverse event, in this, in this case dying from a cardiovascular event within that time. And I asked the same, <laughs> same questions to members of the public, to practice nurses, to, to GPs and consultant physicians, um, which may date, date the study. I got some very angry letters from uh, consultant physicians at Norfolk and Norwich saying, how did I, I dare to use the same form of words when writing to patients as writing to doctors? Uh, 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 but the difference was substantial. So um, uh, members of the public said they'd, they'd only really want to take medicine if, if, if one of them was going to benefit from every 33 people being treated. Um, practice nurses, interestingly, the same as the public. GPs, a bit more uh, gung ho. They said we'd want, you know, if about 50 people were, uh, took treatment for one benefit, that would be about right. Which, incidentally, was the evidence based answer. That was the figure from the uh, MRC uh, mild hypertension trial, which is the first evidence based trial of, uh, of hypertension. Uh, and consultant physicians, uh, one would say 100 people could be treated for one benefit. And presumably context is playing a part of this. If you're a patient, you see people taking medicines and getting side effects from them. If you're working in a hospital treating people with strokes, you're seeing the adverse events, uh, the adverse effects of, of the underlying condition. So the context is very important. Um, and um, the... Um, the, the context that we're coming from is important, and also the, uh, the attitudes to treatment and the type of things, our expectations for what sort of treatment we, we, we want. I was looking at something to do with depression the other day, and came across Andrew Solomon, who some of you might know, who's written very movingly about depression. I see somebody's nodding in his book, The, the Noonday Demon. So I'm going to read you a quote. He did some work in Rwanda just after the Rwandan Civil War, dealing with people who'd had horrific experiences. Uh, during the war, um, and had been some aid workers had been sent out to run counselling programmes and support support for 
the survivors of the uh, genocide in Rwanda. And he asked what a Rwandan man, um, how, how this was going. And this is his description of what the Rwandan man said to him. He said um, uh, about the, the therapy for maid workers, he said their practice did not involve being outside in the sun where you begin to feel better. There was no music or drumming to get your blood flowing again. There was no sense that everyone had taken a day off so that the entire community could come together to try and lift you up and bring you back to joy. Instead, they would take people one at a time into these dingy little rooms and have them sit, sit around for an hour or so and talk about bad things that happened to them. We had to ask them to leave. So our expectations of what type of treatment work uh, are clearly very important. Uh, I mentioned Archie Cochran at the start. Uh, and his, his, he was one of the most influential people in bringing the new idea about randomised control trials uh, into widespread use so we could have an evidence base for medicine. Uh, and if we've got all that evidence-based medicine, why, why do we need to, to worry about preferences? So uh, one, one reason is generalizability, the extent to which something that works in, say, Suffolk, how do we know it also works in Norfolk? Um, and we, we, we are very lucky in this country with NICE, I think, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, which is internationally respected for producing very high quality guidelines about, about healthcare. Um, and we thought we'd do a study looking at the extent to which NICE guidelines for primary care are uh, based on primary care evidence. So this is Asma, I think, might be here. She has a low asthma, if not. Uh, asthma, he was... Uh, uh, did a fantastic job on this study, trawling through um, at 111 kilograms, which is our metric for guidelines. This is just two years of NICE guidelines that are um, printed over two years. Uh, we didn't print them all out, but that's how much they would have been if we, if we had printed them all out. Um, and we went through 45 guidelines published by NICE in two years, 22 of them were relevant to primary care, and that went down this Russian doll, I call it, going down the side of, at each stage, just taking the primary care relevant bits and, and, and letting them off the fact that the other bits. We ended up with about 1,500 studies that were relevant to primary care, um, and of those 1,500, only about 38% of the studies had actually been conducted in primary care, and we considered with the most you know, broad inclusion criteria we could possibly imagine uh, had anything to do with primary care. So that means about 50, overall about 15% of the, of the nice, 22 NICE guidelines that are, that are aimed at primary care. Only about 15% of the recommendations are evidence-based in the most evidence-based guideline uh, production uh, house in the world. So there's clearly a, um, an, an element of uh, freedom and scope for stepping outside clinical guidelines when that's the, that's the very best evidence that we've got. Um, and uh, some of you will be familiar with John Adonis, who's looked at, he, this is a, a, a result of his study where he had several hundred thousand systematic reviews. A systematic review is where you take randomized control trials, usually randomized control trials, on a particular topic and you put them all together to get a review of trying to make sense of a whole load of different trials and come out with one answer. And his point is we've had this, epi this epidemic, this uh, huge rise in the, in the production of systematic reviews that aren't necessarily terribly helpful to the point that in quite a lot of clinical areas there's now more systematic reviews than there are underlying trials that are being reviewed. Uh, and, and he comes up with 3% is the figure after going through several hundred thousand systematic reviews are both decent, in, a, uh, in other words reasonably well conducted, you know, strong methods, and clinically useful, in other words have a, ask a question that somebody might care about the answer of. So we, we've got, despite this huge amount of evidence we've got, we've not got a lot that, that, that applies well to um, an individual uh, person. So coming back to NICE, how uh, NICE try and uh, 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 make sense of this evidence base and communicate it to people is these smiley charts. I really like, I think they're, they're, they're great. So the one on the left is, uh, the current guidelines are, are, are roughly, if you've got, got about 10% risk of a future cardiac event, then uh, you, should be, you should discuss whether you want to start a statin with your doctor. So these are 100 people, so each smiley face is a person. Uh, by definition, 10 of them, the bottom row of yellows and reds, are going to have a cardiac event because they're all at 10% risk of a cardiac event over 10 years. Uh, if the, all 100 took, took statins, uh, then four of them would no longer have the adverse event that they were going to have if they didn't take statins, and the other six still would. Um, there's also an increased risk of diabetes from statins, so the other slide they, they produced for patients talks about the same 100 people um, and uh, six people are going to develop diabetes with or without statins because that's the risk in this population of developing diabetes. Another three will if they put on a torvastatin over five years. 
So that's your kind of risk. But the, the, and it's fantastic. I really like this sort of thing. But the problem is, of course, you don't know where you are. You know, that, that's the, we, even with statins, where we've got we probably one of the best evidence base for an intervention uh, uh, that there is, you don't know which individual you are. So it still seems to me it's entirely rational to sit down as an individual and say, great, I get the population evidence is overwhelming, but for me as an individual, it can be an entirely rational decision um, not, to, not to take that. So, uh, which brings me on to classification. How do we classify both di diagnoses to know which box we're going to put people in when we recommend treatment, if that's the right thing to do, and what are the problems with that? Uh, some of you will be uh, familiar with Ursus Verley, who I, I really like, and his idea about um, tidying up art. So this is, he, he's tidying up Beethoven's Furelies uh, here. And the, the point for, for me about this is that Clearly, in the whole, something is lost. We get some very nice quantitative information here, uh, but we, we lose something from the, from the whole when they, they're combined in, in a particular way. And uh, the, the obvious, you know, clunky parallel is about putting people into lots of diagnostic categories rather than reviewing the human. Uh, I, I, I just, I've just come back this afternoon from um, Cambridge. I've been interviewing people for our academic clinical fellows in uh, public health here at UEA. Uh, really strong field. I'd have been delighted if, uh, for any of them, so it was a, a pleasure interviewing them. And uh, so here's Ursus Valley again with this, and, I, and it occurred to me we should just use this as a, as a, as a screening tool for interviews for uh, epidemiological research posts, because I actually liked the tidied up one better than the original, <laughs> and uh, I thought if you could, you could pick epidemiologists by which one they prefer. Uh, and here's another list I like again, just about the, you know, to, for me, the subjective nature of any classification system. It makes sense to, to somebody when they do the classification, but it's not always uh, obvious in which way uh, it, 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 to someone outside that, that it makes sense. I, I like this list. Okay, one of my, my favourite books, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, uh, which uh, puts me in a particular generation, I think. But he, he has a lovely quote that I've come back to a lot about... Uh, classification, which I'd like to read to you if I may. Uh, he says, we, we take a handful of sand from the endless landscape of awareness around us and call that handful of sand the world. Once we have the handful of sand, the world of which we are conscious, a process of discrimination goes to work in it. This is the knife. We divide the sand into parts, this and that, here and there, black and white, now and then. The discrimination is the division of the conscious universe into parts. The handful of sand looks uniform at first, but the longer we look at it, the more diverse we find it to be. <coughs> Excuse me. Each grain of sand is different, no two are alike. Some are similar in one way, some are similar in another way. And we can form the sand into separate piles on the basis of this similarity and dissimilarity. Shades of colour in different piles, sizes in different piles, grain shapes in different piles, subtypes of grain shapes in different piles, grades of opacity in different piles, and so on and on and on and on. You'd think the process of subdivision and classification would come to an end somewhere, but it doesn't. It just goes on and on. I wonder if he was thinking of William Blake's to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower. Um, okay, so classification brings me on to global burden of disease, which to me is one of the uh, ultimate classification projects in um, medical research. It's a huge attempt, a huge and ambitious attempt to uh, classify every single death in the entire world. And uh, they come up with, at the highest level, uh, slides like this. So this is the total number of deaths in the world from 1950 to, to 2017, colour-coded by age. So that's a sort of overview of the, the total, uh, the highest level output from the Global Burden of Disease project before we get down into all the classification into numerous subtypes. Uh, does anybody know what the 1960, the huge increase of world deaths in 1960 was? Uh, no, no, could have been, no. Yeah, it was the, the Chinese Great Leap Forward, Chairman Mao's Great Leap Forward, which I hadn't, I hadn't realised had caused so many tens of millions of uh, deaths, attempt to modernise. So that's um, uh, GBD, and then we can start drilling down into it. So I've got here the, this is the, the, for Norfolk, uh, this is 2017, which is the latest data that's publicly available. If, if anyone's feeling geeky and wants to go onto the GBD website, they've got the most fantastic uh, website. They're funded by um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and everything is, is uh, on the basis that everything is a public good. I was at a, a, a GBD conference in um, May this year, and the Bill and Melinda Gates a funder, whose who's brief it is to support this study, comes to the conference, and he was there sticking his hand up halfway through presentation, saying, why am I seeing this for the first time in a conference presentation? Why is this not up on your website? And the poor people say, you know, we're just, you know, this is a first. 
first slide. So they really get intense pressure from the funder to, to make everything open access, and they have a huge amount of information up. So this is Norfolk. Uh, these are um, uh, deaths for men and women, all ages, in 2017. Broad colour codes, uh, red is uh, infectious disease, green is accidents and injuries, blue is non-communicable disease. So you can see at a glance, uh, most of us in Norfolk are dying of non-communicable disease. And this is the highest level classification of disease. We've got CVD, cardiovascular disease, and neoplasms or heart disease, neoplasms or cancers. So just over 40% of us that will uh, die of coronary heart disease, just over 40% of uh, neoplasms in Norfolk, and then we can break that down to a different, uh, down to the next level. And you can immediately start seeing you can play games with the level of classification depending on what your policy message is. And for example, if you want to say cancer is the biggest cause of death, you need a higher level of classification because as soon as it's broken down into individual causes of cancer, it makes IHD, ischemic heart disease, seem like a much bigger problem. So there's games to be played with classification, but it's, uh, it's a good website there. Okay. Um, so, um, where was I? Um, yeah, so we, that, that Norfolk is one of uh, 150 upper tier local authorities in England. And we, uh, we, we produce these results for every one of those 150 upper tier local authorities um, at the end of last year. And we, uh, we then produced these big um, charts. This one is truncated to fit on the page. We, we stratified them by deprivation, starting with the most deprived local authority in the country, Blackpool, going all the way down to the least deprived, which is Wokingham. And I've just taken the top 15 and bottom 15 here, because otherwise it obviously ends up being a huge chart of what John Ford did this uh, work with me uh, called the Tartan Rugs, and we started colour coding these, he's, he's Scottish, John. And uh, we, so you can see the, the red is worse than, worse than national average, blue is better. So you can see immediately this patterning um, by uh, deprivation there with um, um, ELSA. And these are the, the different causes of the top to leading causes of death along, along the, the columns. Um, so remarkably consistent, higher deaths from nearly all causes in more deprived areas. And of course, this, you know, this isn't because the weather, I mean, the weather is different in Blackwall from Wokingham, but it's hard to imagine that this is something to do with geography. This is, this is to do with wealth. Um, and, and we know about that. It's another study I've been working on since, in fact, for so, so long that uh, I'm, I'm now eligible to be included in it. Uh, the, it's the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. And, and one of our early headline findings from that was this 10-year gap. So uh, a quintile of population, this is dividing the population into five equal segments by wealth. Just chop them up, five equal groups. And if you move up from one quintile to the next quintile up in terms of wealth, you gain about 10 years of... Um, of uh, healthy life. So an extraordinarily powerful effect or a powerful association between um, wealth and uh, reporting good health. Uh, 10 years uh, for every extra quintile. So that's, that was work on um, ELSA. And one of the other um, headline findings from that was we looked at quality of care and we found that even for a fairly basic level of quality of care, uh, when you were very charitable about, uh, about the extent, about uh, achievement, with a very low, low threshold for, for ticking the boxes that was achieved. Out of nearly 20,000 items of indi indicated care we looked at, only about 62% is achieved. So we've got you know, about two-thirds of care being achieved. About a third of basic care is, is still not, be, not being achieved. So there's lots of scope for uh, improving access to uh, basic care uh, that may help reduce some of these inequalities. Uh, and, and there are different levels at which you can do that. So one of the things we were particularly pleased at with our work on global burden of disease was that the NHS long-term plan, which was published at the beginning of the year, uh, picked up on a lot of the work in that and used it to set their priorities. Um, and this is all very good. And you know, we've got lots of academic pats on the back for somebody noticing the research we've been doing here at UEA. Uh, but then my colleagues in, in public health here in Norwich said, well, can you come and tell us about this work and tell us what we need to do as a result of all this very clever work, which, of course, is much more uh, difficult. So I, I had a look at the, the figure for Norfolk. You have to take in Norfolk, Cambridgeshire, and then the top and bottom, Blackpool and Wokingham, um, uh, the top and bottom in terms of deprivation. Uh, these are our, our top, top causes of um, disability-adjusted life here. So we've now moved on to look at causes of disability rather than causes of death in the same data set. And again, the colour coding is the same with red being significantly worse um, and green being significantly better. Uh, 
And we can see that Norfolk does pretty well. The, the white non-coloured boxes, Norfolk's just, you know, it's, no, it's neither worse nor better than expected. It doesn't mean that there's not scope for improvement, but it's not an outlier compared to any other area in the country. Was the one, re and we're doing, you know, better on lung cancer rates and, and lung disease, uh, falls, asthma, maybe that's due to, you know, better smoking rates. Uh, so respiratory things, we seem to do better on Norfolk. But drug use, drug use disorders uh, were the outlier. So we have a problem with uh, drug use disorders in Norfolk that most people knew about. It wasn't news particularly to public health, but they were surprised to see it was this uh, size of an effect. And there's a number of reasons, historical and current, uh, as to why Norfolk has a particular problem with drugs. So what, um, what are we going to do about that? Um, and around that time, um, Emily Clark, I think, is here, so I'll come in somewhere. Hi, Emily, if you're, if you're here, uh, who's a GP working at City Reach Health Services down in the centre of Norwich, where they work with uh, vulnerable adults, so migrant population, homeless people, sex workers, drug users, uh, pe the people who have, find it difficult to engage with norm normal general practice. Um, uh, came to see me and said, can you give us some help uh, with an evaluation so that we can justify funding for the renewal of our service? At this time, did rather, rather well with this drug use disorder problem. So I thought, well, let's have a look at what's happening at, at, at the local level with this. And I've got a quote uh, from Emily's uh, um, study here. It's probably the longest relationship I've had in my life in terms of, like, meeting somebody for any length of time. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, definitely. So, like, uh, yeah, so obviously if I had to, then I would with grace, you know, but like preferably. And the, the reason behind that is the relationship you built up with the person. Yes, yeah. and she knows me and she knows that, you know, I'm not trying to put a fast one when I say things and she knows where I'm at, she knows that I'm not trying to get medication out of her or, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, and what I'm saying is real. Uh, so time and time again, what emerged from um, Emily's interviews with patients at City Reach w was the importance of trust. This, these are people who'd been serially betrayed by uh, everybody in their lives, and often this was the first time they'd had a relationship of trust with anybody. Uh, and mutual respect and human content. And, and that, that patient was talking about the requirement to be moved on from City Reach. They're funded to, for people for a year, the idea being that after a year, people are ready to be moved on into uh, normal general practice. But of course, for people like that, if this is the first time they've had a relationship of trust, it's difficult. Um, and in fact, we, Emily did try and get hold, hold of that patient because I want, wanted to ask if he wanted to come here and just to let him know I was going to use his quote and he's disappeared off the system having been moved on from City Reach. So, um, yeah, so the importance of trust, mutual respect, human contact. Um, and uh, before I move on from City Reach, Emily also did some work with um, my, Migrant Health and I'd been in, uh, I, like, I like this, this uh, quote from a focus group. This is a 38-year-old um, female Iranian uh, asylum ticket says at the bottom, and uh, which demonstrates to me the fact that it was uh, she she could she appreciated the respect being shown to her even by a gesture, which was a man trying to shake hands with her, which she found difficult, didn't know what to do with in her culture, but she could see that the underlying, although the gesture was wrong, the underlying motivation was good, and this was about a way of showing respect and building human contact. So we started with Rosa and her, her human-free medical journey. What were her priorities, predicaments and preferences? How could she discover them and escape the trap of multiple narrow diagnoses and treatments without sharing the vulnerability and humanity that are essential for the development of trust? And there's a lot of work showing that uh, some sharing of vulnerability is a very important, is, is essential for a relationship of trust to develop. And doctors can do that. And I think those of you in clinical practice will, will uh, I hope, identify with this sharing of a certain element of, of vulnerability and, uh, and openness that, that, that helps build that relationship of trust. So uh, can you do that with a computer rather than with a person? Uh, the challenge, I think, for us academics, particularly in, in the room, is to produce the research evidence about that space where patients and doctors uh, can establish trust uh, and, and how this can coexist with the role of technical diagnostician and uh, prescriber and where AI can fit into this and hopefully improve care. Um, I, I, was, I, I was asked to give a seminar somewhere else on, on Friday and I, I talked about similar themes there uh, and one of the GPs in the room got up and said, you should see, see some of my clinical colleagues. Of course a computer could do better than them. It's so easy to train them. It slightly kind of uh, destroyed my argument that there's these high-level human skills. So, um, um, okay, so I'll finish by returning to Ian McEwen. 
uh, and his book Machines Like Me. Um, the, the fictional fictional developer of the artificial humans, which it, it's like, the book's slightly disconcerting in that it sort of plays with time a bit and it plays with real characters. So he's fictional, he's, he's, now, he's called Alan Turing and he's based on the real life Alan Turing, uh, but there's various things have been tweaked. And he's the, he's the guy who's developed these artificial humans that are called A and E's for Adam and Eve's. Um, and um, they, they start, the, the computers start destroying themselves, the, the uh, art artificial humans, because they can't cope with the uh, ambiguities and sadnesses and cruelties of, that humans uh, seem able to, to live with, because they were programmed to always do the right thing. Uh, and uh, so the Alan Turing character describes his computers like this. He says, there's one particular form of intelligence that all the A and E's know is superior to theirs. This form is highly adaptive and inventive, able to negotiate novel situations and landscapes with perfect ease and theorize about them with instinctive brilliance. I'm talking about the mind of a child before it is tasked with facts and practicalities and goals. The A and E's have little idea of play, the child's vital mode of exploration. Thank you.